Hello, glad to see you on my channel. I really value it. And today I want to share with you a wonderful story. It's a dramatic story that will come as a total shock to everybody. It is a really amazing story. So enjoy watching it. Diana most liked to work in the country house, away from the hustle and bustle of the city and the fresh air. She ran her own company. Sometimes she just needed a break from her daily routine. To be alone with herself and gardening helped her do that. Her husband, Kevin, was not a big fan of tinkering with the soil, but he understood his wife's desire to be out in nature. Everything he was trusted to do in the house required brute male strength. To dig in the garden, mend things, chop and fetch firewood. He put up with these weekly tasks and pretended to enjoy them as well. Look at the roses, said Diana, and held the flower right up to his nose. This year, the roses bloomed particularly lushly. I see. Don't you like it? I don't know. I think the flowers would have grown without us. Nature is very smart. Smarter than man. Yeah, right. Do you know how much effort it takes to grow a rose like that? I took care of it every week. You just like messing around with them? Wow. Are you saying that my work in the garden has no effect on anything at all? You see how hard I try. You did well to praise her. Kevin looked at her thoughtfully. In their family, Diane made all the money. He worked his heart out as a foreman in a factory. His wife constantly nagged him about it and offered to participate in their joint family business. Kevin said every time that it wasn't his, that he wasn't interested in dealing with suppliers, building relationships with customers. And most of all, he didn't like doing the bookkeeping. Every time Diane would start arguing with him and tell him about the benefits, proving that it was very profitable to run your own business, then Kevin would usually retire to another room. He didn't even want to be a part of the conversation. It's getting colder, Diana said. There's supposed to be a thunderstorm tonight. Did you chop some wood? So there they are. Why are they here? Should they be in the house? While I'm finishing up here, go melt the fireplace. Whatever you say. Kevin picked up a bundle of firewood and tried to get up, but immediately he was squirming in great pain. The sensation was familiar to him from past seizures. He had kidney disease. What's the matter with you? My wife asked unhappily. It'll pass. Don't tell me it started again. No, it's going to be okay. You remember what the doctor said, don't you? They did everything they could. If you have an attack, no one will save you. I'm relieved now, Kevin said. He tried again to carry the firewood, but he only had the strength to go into the hallway and drop it on the floor. The man immediately collapsed beside them. What have you got there? Diana shouted from the vegetable garden when she heard the rumbling. There was no answer. Then the woman carefully straightened her back and held her lower back with one hand. Slowly, she walked towards the house. In the hallway, she immediately saw her husband lying there. What's the matter with you? Do you have a problem? Your kidneys again? He nodded, unable to utter a word from the pain. You're always giving me trouble. Probably drank another beer. Now you're suffering. An ambulance. He wheezed. I'll call you in a minute. I'm not going to drag you home by myself. Diane picked up her phone and called an ambulance when she finished talking and returned to the hallway. Her husband was already unconscious from severe pain. She crossed her arms over her chest and looked at him unhappily. When will it all be over? She asked. Kevin's health problems had long been a headache for her. He could go to the hospital for a month and she had to work alone and still do the housework. Naturally, when he was discharged, he couldn't help her. At the same time, he needed care and had to spend more money on medications and procedures. The doctors warned him that he could only have seizures, but it was impossible to cure his illness. Seizures can get worse and occur more often. Then the man would have to live almost all the time in the hospital under the supervision of professionals. This was not an option that his wife wanted to accept. She didn't want to spend the rest of her youth on taking care of a sick man. 
The ambulance arrived 20 minutes later. Kevin was loaded on a stretcher and taken to the nearest hospital. The man opened his eyes and, to his surprise, found himself lying at home in his bed. Diane called out to him as he woke up. His wife said grudgingly, What happened to me? As usual, a seizure. Why was I brought home and not to the hospital? And you would have slept even longer. You were in the hospital for two days. The doctors said you were stable and they let you go home. Now I have to take care of you. Thank you. Kevin leaned back on his pillow, closing his eyes from weakness. He was hungry. The nurse is coming. She'll fix you up. What about you? And I have work, business meetings. I can't fight with you here. The woman was putting on her makeup in front of the mirror. Don't leave me. You will have a nurse with you. She is experienced. Diana, please stay with me. If you only knew how tired I am of hospitals and medicines... And how bored am I with them? You have no idea. My wife exclaimed grudgingly. Well, if you have business to attend to, I won't keep you. What did they say? The doctor said it got worse. They gave you a bunch of tests to take. The list is on your desk, and there are recommendations and prescriptions for medication. Can I see it? Can't you stand up and get it yourself? I guess I can. Kevin threw back the blanket and put his feet on the floor. His eyes immediately went black. You can't do anything on your own. The woman handed him a piece of paper from the table. It says terminal stage. The doctor explained what that means. Kevin worried as he read the doctor's report. It means they don't want to treat you. What do you mean, they don't? Are they just leaving me to suffer pain and die? There are painkillers on the table. Is there really no chance? Can you see for yourself? The bell rang. Diane ran to open the door. On the threshold stood a young girl with a white suitcase. Good afternoon. I am a caregiver. You are right on time. I am Diane on the bed. Your ward, Kevin. It's a pleasure to meet you. The girl undressed, washed her hands in the bathroom and went into the bedroom. She took a blood pressure monitor out of her suitcase and sat on the edge of the bed to take her blood pressure. Kevin, I see you can manage without me, Diana said. Don't worry, Maria assured her. Then she turned to the man. Your blood pressure is very low. How are you feeling? I feel very weak, Kevin complained. I'll make you lunch. Eat it and you'll feel better. Maria put the tonometer away. I'm off. I'll be back late tonight. Maria, here's some money for you, and you'll get the rest when you turn in your shift. There's even more here than we bargained for. Think of it as a bonus. Diane threw on a light jacket, took a bright orange bag. If Kevin had been able to draw any conclusions, he would have realized that his wife, dressed like that, was not going to work at all. But now he was lying there, with his eyes closed, trying not to pass out. Diana bought two takeout coffees at the cafe. On the street, she gave one of the glasses away. On the street, she gave one of the glasses away. Thank you, darling. I've been dreaming about it all day, the man said. He opened the lid and gently served it to the hot drink. You're welcome. Let's take a walk, or do you have to go home now? I don't need to. Let's walk through the park. The man's name was Alexander. He gallantly offered Diane his hand, and the couple walked along the path, along which neatly under cut bushes. Are you different today? It's no big deal. Something happened to you, and you don't want to tell me about it. There is nothing wrong with me. My husband, on the other hand, what's the matter with him? Did he sing after all? With a dismissive chuckle, Alexander asked, No, his health doesn't allow it. It's worse in the hospital again. The hospital refused to treat and nurse him. I have to do it at home. Yeah, Alexander took out a cigarette and smoked. And you're right, you shouldn't waste your time on him. I don't understand why you even bother with him. Hey, Alexander. Diana sank down on a bench under a big lilac bush. I think about it all the time, too. Can't you divorce him? He won't agree. That's the spirit. 
That's a real man. He's already got one foot in the coffin. Doesn't he realize you're still a young woman? And now he's a burden. I don't think he's thinking about it. Does he know about me? Alexander asked curiously. You're always leaving the house with no explanation. He thinks I go to work. Diane, he doesn't appreciate you at all. Aren't you already here with him? And let's get married and live as a normal family. Alexander took his beloved's hand and pressed it to his chest. You think I don't want that? So, is this a good time? No. He won't give me a voluntary divorce. I would have to drag myself through the courts. And then he would sue me for half of the jointly acquired property. And this is my business house. You started the business on your own. But at that point, I was already married. Anyway, divorce is not the answer. And how many more years are we going to have to hide our relationship? I want us to live together. I understand, Diana said sadly. I myself would be glad to take him anywhere, as long as I never saw him again. But how to do it, and where to take him? That's a great idea. I remember you telling me that your grandmother was from the village, and she left you a house there. That's right. I'd forgotten all about that cabin. There was a sudden sparkle in Diana's eyes. Then everything works out very well. If anyone has any questions, you can always say that your husband decided to go to his little motherland to die, and it's not our fault. You think, I'm sure, take him to that house, and to all his neighbors and acquaintances. Tell them that he himself has expressed a desire to live in the countryside for a while. You know, there are some people who believe that fresh air and natural foods can cure anything. My husband is definitely not like that. No one would believe that. How would they know? You have no idea how people change when death approaches. My grandfather was always a rude, angry man. He didn't even have any friends, because it was unbearable to talk to him. And what do you think? As soon as he got his terminal diagnosis at the age of 72, it was like he was switched. He was outgoing. Went to church for the first time in his life. Charity work? You're right. My husband also changed during his illness. You see, but not for the better. He was a wuss before, and now he's moaning about every sore spot. Diana remembered with indignation. Life with him had become unbearable, so now we have a plan. The woman looked into Alexander's eyes and saw such determination and love for her there that all her doubts about her husband instantly dissipated. Where are we going for the third time in her short trip? Kevin asked. Out for some fresh air, Diane answered, not taking her eyes off the road. You'll love it there. Can you at least tell me where it is? In the village. That's the news. I can't go to the countryside now. Why is that? Didn't you hear what the doctor said? I'm too weak. Don't be silly. We're just going there to get some fresh air and take a walk in the woods. I'll feel better if we get home when I take my medicine on time, Kevin said, rubbing his back in the kidney area with his hand the whole time. I can already feel it starting to hurt now. I took my medicine with me. Let's stop and I'll drink it. We have a long way to go. Be patient. They drove in silence for a while. Kevin was beginning to see what was going on. His wife avoided making eye contact with him, and it wasn't her style to surprise him with tourist trips, but he was afraid to ask her directly. He already knew what a burden he was to her, despite the growing pains. He stopped talking about the pills and decided to let it be. The car stopped outside a ramshackle wooden house with boarded, up windows. Doesn't anyone live here? Kevin asked. My grandmother used to live here, but she died a long time ago. This house stands empty. I thought it might be possible to live in it. He looks very old. That's just outside. Diana grabbed some bags from the trunk. Her husband followed her doomfully into the house. Sure enough, it was just as decrepit inside as it looked outside. The wooden floors were damp and unpleasantly stilted. The once-white stove was covered with dust and cobwebs hung in the corners. 
It's okay to live normally, Diana said after looking around. Only if you clean it well and make major repairs. Kevin struggled to sit down on the couch, from which a spring immediately jumped out and hurt his leg. You're leaving me here alone. I have to go to work. That's what I thought. About what? That's what I thought you wanted to get rid of me. Don't make it up. You'll be very happy here. Diana laid out her husband's things next to him on the couch. Here are your warm clothes, and here are your medicine and some money. Diana, aren't you ashamed? Why should I be ashamed? I'm doing what's best for you. You know I'm going to die here. How to get from here to the nearest hospital and without a car. The ambulance rides here just fine. We drove about 50 minutes out of town. If I get sick, I won't be saved in time, Kevin said. And he lowered his head in doom. But I know what you mean. No one wants to take care of a sick man when they can find a new healthy husband. I'm not going to look for anybody. I don't know what you're talking about. That's it, you understand. I saw a man walk you home yesterday. It was a colleague of mine. Did he kiss you just as a friend? Why are you following me? Okay, that's your business. Kevin waved his hand and began to sort out his things. I know I'm not alive anymore. Everything will be all right. Diane patted him on the shoulder and left the house without looking him in the eye. She got in the car and watched through the window for a while as her husband sat staring at the floor. She was a tough woman. But now even she felt something like pity in her soul. Not to give in to her feelings, she started the engines as fast as she could on the road, leaving the village far behind. Kevin did not know how many days he had lain on his bed, moving only to take his medicine. Oddly enough, he did not feel hungry. The man was barely conscious and in severe pain. He thought he was hallucinating because he heard the door to the house open and someone came inside. Footsteps sounded from the front door and stopped in the room. From the sound of it, someone fell on the couch and cried. Kevin couldn't tell if he was dreaming or if this was really happening. Was it his wife coming back to take him home? He tried to get up but immediately felt a sharp pain and plopped back down on the pillow. All he could do was to remain speechless. Who's there? A frightened voice came from the room. A man spoke to him again. Stay back. I have a pepper spray with me. A young female voice warned him. Who are you? And how did you get here? All right, I'll get it. But don't try to trick me if you come at me from behind. I am not responsible for myself. The girl kept her eyes on Kevin and went out to get water. She scooped a mug from the bucket and returned to the house. The girl cautiously walked over to Kevin and handed him the water. Here, drink it. Where did you come from? Who are you? My name is Kevin. My manna. Are you homeless? How did you end up in this house? Do you know that it has a landlady and she can come over? I know. Kevin tried to catch his breath. Hand me those pills in the yellow jar over there. Why do you have so much medicine here? Are you very sick? Anna handed him a packet of pills. Do you have any painkillers? Maybe there are some at home. Where is the nearest pharmacy? It's about 60 kilometers. But now, after the downpour, you can't drive there. Are you in pain? The girl sat trustingly on the edge of his bed. Shall I send for a doctor? You don't look so good. I can do it myself. Where are you from? I live on the other side of the village. I was kicked out of my home. I'm an orphan, and my stepmother and I fight over every little thing. She might even hit me, and I have nowhere else to go. So I come to this house to cry alone. You're probably not interested in any of this. Poor thing, Kevin sympathized with the girl, but immediately coughed and clutched at his back. What are you in pain? What are you? A doctor. I may not be educated, but I know a thing or two about medicine. Let me examine you. Anna lifted his shirt and put her hand on the sore spot. Kevin almost howled in pain, but restrained himself. She watched his face, touched his hand, temperature, and looked into his eyes. It's the kidneys, 
Businesslike, Anna said. I already know that. She took his hand and felt for a pulse. Then examined the veins. You're not doing well at all. Do you need rescuing? Forget about me. I already know that my end is near. Do you know that it is a sin to be sick? Trying to leave life voluntarily. Just look at you. You must be about 45 years old. You've got a lot to live for, and you're already calling for death. And look, it will hear you and come. You don't even have a kettle here. Then I'll bring you my plates. You need some utensils too. I'll be right back. It's okay. Kevin held her hand. You're a young girl. You should be thinking about your life, not how to save a hopelessly sick old man. I've nursed more than that. My grandfather was about to die. He also kept complaining that his heart was aching. Now he's all right. He even found a new love. Did you cure him? Of course I'm a healer. Our teacher at the orphanage was, too. She taught me everything. I've been living without medicine since I was a kid. If something happens, I just go out into the fields and gather medicinal herbs. What are you talking about? I have a lot of medications, and they don't always help me, and will throw those drugs away. Don't you dare, I'll die of pain here. I'll be right back. The girl threw a handkerchief over her head and strode out of the house. Kevin saw her walk down the road to the other end of the village and then suddenly take off and run as fast as she could. Alexander Diane's young lover was enjoying his new place of residence. As soon as the woman sent her husband to the village, he immediately moved in with her. He liked the fact that now there was no need to hide. In addition to successfully combining her family duty to simply help Diana in whatever way he could. Wow, how clean we are, the woman remarked, shifting into her house slippers. I know how to mop the floors, the young lover joked. I ordered food for dinner tonight. Very well. Diana dropped her bag in the hallway, and Alexander immediately picked it up and carefully hung it on the hanger. It's not a good day, said the woman. It's dry. I think I'll lie down for a while, if you don't mind, of course. Alexander covered his beloved with the plaid and kissed her on the cheek. If something happened you want to talk about it, you don't have to keep it to yourself. I'll listen to you. I don't know, Alexander. Do I want to talk about it? I don't have very good news. Is there something wrong with your health? Alexander looked at the woman questioningly. We'll deal with it together. No, there's nothing wrong with my health. The only thing is that these warriors are already giving me a heart attack. Now the man took a glass of water and poured some Corvallo into it. Drink it and you'll feel better. Thank you. Diana drank the whole glass in a gulp. We'll probably have to move to a smaller apartment. Why? It's only temporary. You see, I had a little problem with my business. The suppliers brought us the wrong product. The customers brought it back. And according to the contract, we can't give it back to the suppliers. As luck would have it, we made a big bet on this deal. And now we've lost both money and the trust of a very important customer. I don't get it. Are you saying that your business is gone? Alexander frowned, tried to understand this cunning scheme, but he didn't understand business. Well, there is still a chance that everything will be restored. But this case has set us back ten years. Now our earnings are going to be much lower. That's why I'm saying I can't pay for such a big place anymore. How can I explain it to you? We used to have a big international company. And now because of this incident, we can only operate in the U.S., which greatly reduces our revenue. I still don't understand anything. And where are we going to move to? to an easier neighborhood. Where is that, like, away from the center? And we'll also have to sell the car. That is, we will live in the middle of nowhere, and we will also have to take public transportation. I'm not happy about it either. Alexander pretended to make tea for his beloved. He himself was trying hard to figure out what to do next. On weekends, Diana liked to go to the spa. In her current situation, she had no money for it but she decided to pamper herself anyway and went to the bath. Of course, the usual gorilla wasn't comparable to the elite treatments she was used to, 
with massages, hot stones, a honeydew, and swimming in a huge pool. But she felt a little better. When she returned home, all her thoughts were on how to get her business back on track. Suddenly, she noticed two large bags standing in the living room. Alexander, are you home? Without an answer, she walked through the rooms and found her lover nervously smoking on the balcony. Oh, there you are. Are you back already? Today, I literally stopped by the bathhouse for half an hour. I have to give up my old habits. But that's okay. The main thing is that we have each other. In five years, I'll be back in business. That's a very long time. I'll be 40 by now, Alexander said sadly and took a drag on his cigarette. So what? I'm 42 now? Exactly. But you've already lived a good life. I haven't yet. What do you mean lived? You think I'm going to die because I'm in trouble at work? I wanted to tell you that you've already had a lot of things in your life. You have lived in a luxurious house, spent several months in the Maldives. You have a beautiful car and very expensive clothes. I don't understand where you're going with this. Diana hugged him from behind. I want to have it all, too. Don't you understand why you need to be young if you can't have everything you want, and you'll have everything, too? But when you can start your own business, too, I don't understand why you're still working, where you don't get paid enough. Business is not my thing. Alexander threw his cigarette butt out the window and breathed in the fresh air. Then what do you want? I want to have someone by my side that I can rely on. Do you understand? Frankly, I don't understand, Diana frowned. So all you wanted from me was money and good living conditions. Don't say that. I liked you as a woman. These are the details that emerge. I wonder why there are these bags in the room. They contain your things. I can't do this anymore. Before I told you I had problems with my business, you were happy and swore you loved me. So what has changed in these two days? Everything has changed. I can't lie to you anymore. Alexander turned to the woman and took her by the shoulders. I have another one. What do you mean? Diana was confused. I'm in love, and there's nothing I can do about it. I've only known her a couple of weeks, and you've already decided to leave me for her. You understand that I sent my husband to die in the countryside for your sake. I didn't ask for that. You didn't. And who convinced me that he was a burden to me? That he would be better off in the fresh air? Let him die there. You said it yourself. So now, it's all my fault. Let's break up amicably. Alexander wanted to hug Diane, but she pushed him rather hard. It's an interesting thing. So when I'm a millionaire, she's beautiful. You even agree to share a bed with me. But as soon as I'm a simple woman who loves you, you don't need me. It's not about the money. What are you talking about? The woman opened the closets and dumped all her lover's things in her bag. Go to your new one. She must be rich. And I don't want to see you again. She's got a beautiful house. God, I can't believe I didn't see you as Alphonse. Because I'm not Alphonse. I had real feelings for you. It's just that things are different now. So come live with me. I've already rented a very nice studio apartment. This is not the life for me. Alexander stacked his things neatly in the bag. Diana looked at him and tears streamed down her cheeks. For the first time in her life, she felt so vulnerable right now when she needed the support of someone who loved her the most. She was alone. Don't be mad at me, said Alexander. You'll be all right. Please don't leave me alone. It just so happens. I'll make money again. Just don't leave me now. I'm 42. No one wants me anymore. I mean, for once, I'm really in love with a man. I loved you, too. Stay with me at least until I get used to my new apartment. I'm sorry, but I can't. And don't want to waste my life on charity. So life with me is just charity for you now. Well, get the hell out of here, Diana blurted out angrily. Alexander closed the door behind him, and Diana was all alone. 
She looked in the mirror and noticed how bad she looked. For the last week, the woman had not slept well. Constantly worried about this deal, she had to work at night. It exhausted her, and she had no energy or time to look after herself at all. Looking at her reflection, she thought her personal life would never get better. Her last romance of her life was over, and it had ended in such a ridiculous way. She drugged herself with a bottle of Corvallo. She took a cigarette and went out on the balcony to smoke. Kevin opened his eyes and suddenly felt awake. During the months of his illness, he had managed to get used to the constant pain. But now, he didn't feel it at all. He got to his feet, walked to the kitchen, poured himself a mug of water. He was still weak, couldn't do anything around the house, so he was constantly being cared for. At home, he called out in a hoarse voice. The answer to him was silence. The answer to him was silence. Leaning on a chair with his arm, the man cautiously lowered himself onto the couch. Only now did Kevin notice that there were various herbs of the field hanging near the stove. Would this girl really get him back on his feet? The man did feel better, but he was so disbelieving in his cure, that he was so disbelieving in his cure that even the improvement in his health did not make him optimistic. Kevin looked out the window and saw Anna next to some guy. Apparently, it was her boyfriend. He walked the girl all the way home and Kevin could hear their conversation. Do you live here now? Asked the boy. And it's better than at home. May I come in? Don't. People will see, and what will they say? What do I care what people say? I'm going to marry you. Let's just go in and have some tea. You can't. You don't live alone. The guy frowned. There's actually only one person living there. Why does he live there? Send him to the hospital and move in to live with me. The hospital won't help him. So if he dies, good riddance to him. Do you really choose to care for a dying man instead of having a family life? Is he some kind of relative to you? No, just an ordinary man. And I felt sorry for him. It's not normal. I know that you are very sensitive. You're always feeling sorry for everybody helping everybody. But I don't like the fact that you live with some strange man. Oh, come on. He's practically an invalid. What do I care? I want you to be my wife and take care of me and our family. Maybe you just don't want to marry me. I want to. But I want to help this poor man, too. He's had some things happen in his life that I can't just leave him. You know I'm done. It's either me or him. Are you out of your mind? You know he's a stranger to me. I love you and I plan to build a family with you. I understand that very well. You, on the other hand, seem completely confused. The young man turned to leave. Wait, Anna grabbed him by the sleeve. This conversation is over. No, wait. I choose you. Then stop going to that house. Give me a few more days, the girl pleaded. I'll just leave him some food and medicine. Why can't you forget about him? Maybe there's more to it than treatment. How can you accuse me of that? I think it's pretty obvious. You found yourself some city man, and you live there with him. I don't live with him, I shouted in despair. Rumors were already spreading throughout the village. What other rumors? Everyone saw that some man was brought there, and they brought him in an expensive car. I didn't see it. We were having a scandal with my stepmother at the time. And now what do they say about me in the village? They say you're going to marry him. It can't be. You should have seen him. He was barely alive when I found him. What difference does it make? Well, here's the deal. If you stay in this house again tonight, I'll think the rumors are true, and you and I are breaking up. Wait, give me a couple more days. I said it all. You're home tonight, or you and I will never see each other again and I will break off our engagement. Okay, I hear you. Kevin hurriedly lay down on his bed so that the girl wouldn't guess that he had overheard their conversation. She went inside and walked over to the man's bed. He pretended that he had just woken up. What time is it now? It's evening. I only came to make supper. And then I'll come less often, just to bring you herbs. What do you mean, come less often? I thought you weren't going to come at all. 
Kevin was surprised. If I don't help you, you will die here. No, what are you? I just thought, how much longer can you take care of an old stranger? You're young. You probably have a life of your own, and I'm in the way. Don't think about it. The most important thing is that you get well. I feel much better already, Kevin assured her, and tried to get up. He didn't succeed. You don't have to work so hard. You'll be fine. I changed my mind. I'll come to you as often as I used to. I'll cook for you and do compresses. They seem to help a lot. Anna, let's be honest. There's no cure for me. You don't need to waste your youth on me. Don't be silly, said the girl, and took the basket. I'll go get some new herbs and make you a collection in the morning. If you wish to eat, I have left soup on the table. You are a holy man. Oh, come on. Don't be silly. I just made it for the family and brought you a plate. Good night. Good night. Good night. Anna closed the door behind her and left. Kevin leaned back on his pillow and thought about how he had made life difficult for the girl. After a little thought, he waited. At night, he pulled himself together and got out of bed. No, Anna, I will not let you ruin your life. Because of such an old man as I will be happy with this young man. With these words, he left the house and headed into the woods. As luck would have it, it started to rain rather heavily. Kevin was lying in the bushes, leaning against a large, moss-covered rock. He began to feel the pain in his kidneys again, throbbing all over his body and pounding right into his brain. But he continued to lie on the cold ground, exposing his face to the rain. For a moment, he thought he saw someone come into the bushes. Could this be where they found me, too? He muttered softly. He got down on all fours and crawled deep into the forest. He collapsed in the middle of the clearing and closed his eyes. Kevin called for death. It never came for him. Suddenly he heard some rustling again and opened his eyes. From what he saw, the man froze a few feet away. A wolf was standing away from him, staring into his eyes. Kevin tried to get to his feet, but from weakness he could only crawl back and rest his back against a tree. Here comes my death, he thought. Better to die from a wolf than from disease. Go ahead and attack. Kevin dropped his hands and closed his eyes. A few minutes passed, but nothing happened. He opened his eyes and saw the wolf standing right in front of him. Didn't you come here for me? The wolf stood still and didn't move. Kevin looked closely and saw that the predator had a huge trap hanging from one paw. The wolf was quiet. For only now did the man notice that the animal was not looking at him with rage, but with some kind of silent plea in its eyes. Let me help you. Kevin, you're pregnant too. How strong is the trap? How do you and I open it? The man asked. I couldn't answer that question. She just stared at him without taking her eyes off him. Now we will figure it out. He tried his best to unclench the iron jaws, but he failed. Kevin went wide around himself and found a sturdy stick. This was going to hurt a little. He slipped the stick into the snare and piled on as hard as he could. The she-wolf howled in pain, but after a few seconds the trap opened and she pulled her bleeding paw out of it. That's it, Kevin said, trying to catch his breath. Let me move you or you'll get an infection. He tore the sleeve off his shirt and tied it neatly around the animal's paw. That's it. Go home. After expending the rest of his strength, Kevin lay down on the ground and fell asleep. What was his surprise when he awoke at dawn to find the she? Wolf still sitting next to him. What are you doing? Go home. The she-wolf got up and went into the bushes. But then she came back immediately. She looked at Kevin and poked her nose into his shoulder. What do you want from me? The she-wolf gently gripped his surviving sleeve with her teeth and pulled him toward her. Do you want me to follow you? One of your relatives is trapped too. Curiosity made Kevin feel stronger too. He got up and on his feet went the she-wolf. After walking about 100 yards, she stopped and started digging in the ground. What have you got here? 
She looked now and then at Kevin and kept digging the hole with her big paw. There's something buried here. Let me help you. The man took a stick and began digging along with the wolves. They had already dug a rather deep hole, and suddenly something shiny appeared out of the ground. What the hell was that? The man dropped the stick and began to clean the object with his hand. Some kind of crate. He was soon able to pull out. When he saw the contents, the man even shrieked. So this is gold. He looked at the she-wolf, sitting beside him, wagging her tail. Did you find the treasure? She poked her nose at him. Thank you. That's what you thanked me for the rescue. She-wolf looked into his eyes. She licked his palm goodbye and disappeared into the woods. Kevin didn't realize how he got home. Where have you been? Anna exclaimed fearfully. I've been waiting here for two days, worried. Anna, why did you come? I promised to take care of you. I asked you not to come. Kevin was out of breath, but he found the strength to walk to the kitchen and drink a mug of water in a gulp. Now I'm even glad you're here. Look, Kevin opened the trunk. Anna jumped up and down in surprise. Where did you get this? Did you find a treasure? Look, all of the gold belongs to us now. We are rich now. How so? The treasure. Anna was afraid to even go near such a treasure. But curiosity overcame caution. He was buried, just like that in the woods. How did you find him? It's a long story, and it would still be very hard to believe. I'll tell you this. God must have taken pity on us. You are very rich now. Anna looked inside with admiration. You're rich, too. What are you talking about? You're the one who found the treasure. I'm just sincerely happy for you. I believe that justice has been done. Don't be silly. Kevin took the basket with which Anna went to get herbs and sent a few handfuls of gold coins there. This is your thanks for all you've done for me. I can't. Yes, you can. Just imagine how surprised your stepmother will be when you bring it all home. She's not likely to be happy for me. Anna laughed. The girl hesitantly took the basket in her hands and tried to lift it. How heavy is it? Is all this really happening to us? I couldn't believe it myself at first. What to do with all this now? Perhaps you and I should go into town and exchange it for money. How much will there be in here? The heavy man lifted the trunk with both hands and tried to estimate its weight. I think there's about 10 kilograms here. You're the ones who put me to sleep a little bit more. How much is one kilogram? I don't know, but I think it's expensive. Wait a minute. My wife was a rich woman, bought gold bullion in a bank, if my memory serves me right. She paid $200,000 for one bar. And these are coins, jewels. They must be worth more than that. God. Anna sat down in a chair and covered her face with her hands. She had never held such money in her hands. Can someone take us into town? Kevin asked. My neighbor is a good friend of mine. He has a car. I'll ask him, and he'll take us. Ask him right now. In town, Kevin and Anna went to the nearest pawn shop. Good afternoon. Do you change gold? Sure. Really, I'm about to start lunch, said the fat woman behind the clerk's counter. Please help us, Anna said, and with great difficulty put the basket of gold on the counter. How much will it cost? You can give us the money right away. What the hell was that? The pawn shop owner even reached for her thick glasses. This is real gold. We've already tested it. Where did you get that much? We found the treasure. How lucky you are, the woman said enviously as she checked the contents of the basket. Gold, indeed in a very good quality. The woman could hardly lift the basket and put it on the scale. And here's some more. Anna put the rest of the gold in the chest on the counter. Do you really want to sell it all? Yes, we want to take the money, Kevin nodded. Let me see if I have that much in my safe. The woman left and soon returned with the black bag. Yes, but you'll have to wait. We're in no hurry. Kevin sat imposingly in some antique chair nearby. The woman took out a money counting machine and began to fill it with one packet after another. Soon she was finished and announced the amount, the amount. It was all done. 
it came to nearly $2 million. How much? With some mixture of excitement and horror, Anna asked again. Are you sure it's that much? At the market price, does it go like this? We're fine with it, Kevin said, and threw the money back in the black bag. Thank you for your work, he said, and he counted out several $100 bills to the woman. God bless you, said the woman, and she crossed herself. They left the pawn shop and climbed back into the car. Kevin generously handed some bills to the driver. This is for your services. Thank you for the ride. Yes, I helped out purely as a neighbor. But I won't refuse money either, said the driver and happily put the bills under his cap. Where to now? Anna asked, first thing in the bank. It's not safe to walk around the village with that kind of money. And then we can celebrate at a restaurant. That's great. Oops. Suddenly Kevin cried out and grabbed his lower back. Are you in pain? It will pass. It doesn't matter now. If I suddenly die, I will bequeath all this money to you. You are not going to die. Were you already on the mend before you decided to run away? Anna said and stroked the man on the shoulder. Nothing. Maybe I'll live a little longer. There's even something to live for now. Isn't there, he said, and looked at the girl. You don't have a father either. You don't have anyone. I wish I had a daughter like you. What are you talking about, Anna said, and immediately tears streamed down her cheek. Did God send me a father and me a daughter? They hugged each other tightly. The driver lit a cigarette, started the car, and drove toward the bank. Diane walked around her huge dacha. Things had gotten really bad in her business, and she had to sell off her possessions. How much money and effort she had invested in its arrangement. Now the woman was waiting for a buyer to come, and they would seal the deal. A white Mercedes stopped at the gate. A well-dressed man and a young girl got out. Good afternoon. Diane said hello and was suddenly taken aback. When she recognized the man as her ex-husband, Kevin, what is the meaning of this? Good afternoon, coldly, the man greeted her. So you are the buyer. Yes, my daughter and I want to buy this cottage. Daughter Diana threw her eyes at the girl. She was dressed all in white. In her hand was an expensive purse made of good leather. When did you have such an adult daughter? We became related recently. So all your married life you've been hiding the fact that you have children? I adopted her. Through Kevin resolutely walked through the wicket into the depths of the garden. It's just as beautiful here as it was before, and the price is very appropriate. Don't you have that kind of money to make a clown out of it? Diane laughed sullenly. I have money, at least enough to buy this lot and the house. How much are you asking for? Ten million, the woman blurted out. At that moment, Diane still felt superior and thought that such a price would scare the man away. But Kevin just smiled and took the pack from his pocket. I can pay in cash. This can't be right. Diana took the money in her hands and checked it for light. It was real. You didn't think I'd lie to you. But wait. It must come as a surprise to you that I'm still alive. Don't say that. Why not? It's true, isn't it? You hoped that I would die and you wouldn't get your hands dirty. But it didn't turn out that way. Why did you suddenly decide to sell your beloved cottage? I want to buy a bigger one, Diane played, and it's none of your business. You want to buy it? Buy it? You're lying again. I remember how much you loved that cottage and would never trade it for anything else. So you've got a big money problem, and judging by the fact that there's no car parked outside the house. Did you come here by train? And don't tell me that's what you wanted. You hate train. You're right, Diana acknowledged, her eyes downcast. Things got really bad for me, and I had to sell the whole business for pennies. Now I've got a job at the store, and I'm going to start all over again. Well, I can't say that I sympathize with you. I wasn't expecting sympathy from you. But if you want to know the truth, I'm really sorry for what I did to you. I have taken my punishment. Sadly, the woman finished and gave the keys to her ex-husband. 
From my heart, I give you my beloved home. Don't worry, Kevin said with some sympathy. We'll keep it at its best. Your roses will bloom even better than they are now. Thank you, said the woman, and went out of the gate. She closed it behind a slit, cast one last glance back, and walked toward the train station. Now a new life was beginning for her, a life she deserved.